of precisely the same thing in the human machine. In other words, he says animals are just simply little machines that operate by mechanical or, or physical uh, impulses and needs and desires. And the same is true, he says, in the human uh, machine. With this difference, that nature alone does everything in the operations of an animal, whereas man contributes as a free agent to his own operations. Man contributes as a free agent to his own operations. What does he mean there in saying that man is a free agent? Uh, this idea of free agency in many ways sounds similar, and indeed it is similar, to Hobbes and Locke, both of whom who said freedom, uh, free, free, freedom of will, some kind of freedom is, is, is a characteristic uh, of natural uh, man or natural uh, pre-social uh, man. But Rousseau seems to add to this something different. Freedom for Hobbes or Locke simply means the freedom to choose to do this or that, the freedom to exercise the will and not to be interfered with by others uh, around us. Rousseau also believes that, uh, but in many ways he adds something else to it. He connects freedom in this same passage to what he calls the, the, the phenomenon or the, or the quality, the faculty of perfectibility, perfectibilité. What does he mean in connecting freedom with, he calls, with what he calls perfectibility? Perfectibility for Rousseau uh, suggests an openness, uh, a sort of unlim virtually unlimited openness to change. Uh, we are the species who not only have the freedom to do uh, this or that, but we are the species who have the freedom, as it were, to become this or that. In a, it is our very openness to change that accounts for our mutability over time. As a species, in other words, we are, you might say, uniquely underdetermined, uh, meaning that our nature is not confined in advance to what it may become. Rather, our nature, for Rousseau, is uniquely suited to alter and transform itself uh, as circumstances change and as we adapt, adapt and adopt to new and unforeseen uh, situations. Perfectibility for Rousseau is not so much a feature of the individual, but it is as it is of the species. And again, whereas Hobbes or Locke assumed that human nature itself remained more or less constant, uh, in the transition from what they call the state of nature to the civil state. Uh, Rousseau believes that human nature has undergone manifold revolutions, as, as he called it, over the source uh, of time. What we are at any one phase of human history or, or human evolution will be very, very different from what we are at any other particular phase. And it is this, what he calls, distinctive and unlimited faculty that he says is the, also the source of all of our misfortunes. So when he says that we are characterized by freedom and associates freedom with perfectibility, he doesn't necessarily mean uh, per by perfectibility that which uh, perfects us. He also says it is that which is at the source of our miseries and our discontents. In many ways, if you wanted to give this book another title, I've already suggested one for it, The Origin of the Species, it could just as well have been called uh, more than a century before Freud, uh, Civilization and Its Discontents, uh, which is in many ways Freud's attempt to rewrite Rousseau's account of the evolution of the human species. But Rousseau notes in this same part that freedom or perfectibility is not our sole natural characteristic, although it is responsible in some way for almost everything that we have become. Everything that we have become is due to this openness to change. Uh, in addition to perfectibility and freedom is the quality that Rousseau calls pitié or pity, compassion. And here is, in a sense, Rousseau at his most characteristic. You could say, here is Rousseau, the founder of Romanticism. Man is not the rational animal, the thinking being, the being with logos, but we are the sensitive creature. Rousseau finds all kinds of evidence 
uh, for assuming that compassion is part of our original nature. He notes in other species a reluctance uh, to witness the pain or suffering of another of its own kind, how an animal will not uh, wish to walk near uh, a dead member of its own species. That seems to, Rousse to indicate to Rousseau, um, even in the other species, a kind of natural core of, of compassion or pity. The fact that we cry at the misfortunes of others who have nothing to do with us is evidence of our original sensitivity. Uh, do we not enjoy crying in movies? Has someone in here ever cried in a movie? Yes, that we all have. Uh, even at people or objects that don't exist, d did we not feel pity uh, for King Kong uh, when we saw that movie? Did we, not, did we not feel pity for a fictional creature that could, could not exist, but yet whose, whose fate somehow affected us in some way? And Rousseau would under, completely understands this. In giving man tears, Rousseau writes, nature bears witness that she gave the human race the softest of hearts. <coughs> the softest of hearts. Man is the sensitive creature, so much so that Rousseau finds evidence in this for what he believes is our natural goodness. The natural goodness of man in the state of nature is to some degree borne out by this quality of pity or compassion that we even share with other species. Why does Rousseau emphasize this quality? Because it is deeply important to him. Uh, you might say, long before Dr. Phil uh, and thousands of other you know, self-help gurus and, and self-help manuals, Rousseau taught us to get in touch with our feelings. One natural man may be compassionate and kind, however, that sentiment, he tells us, is easily overpowered by more powerful passions once we enter society, <laughs> once we become civilized or socialized. We cease, once we are in society, to care about others and we become calculating and mercenary in our motives. Selfishness and egoism are in fact reinforced for him by the development of reason. Reason, he writes, is what engenders egoism and reflection strengthens it. The development of rationality, he thinks, uh, simply hastens our corruption by the assisting in the development of different vices. And the task of the second discourse, uh, at least its rhetorical task, is in many ways to recover our natural selves, compassionate, gentle, kind, from the artificial, corrupt, and calculating selves we have all become in civil society. And who can't read that in Rousseau without realizing that there is a significant germ of truth in what in what he says. Uh, did Rousseau believe it possible then, or desirable, to return to the state of nature, to, re to return to some kind of prelapsarian condition before the beginnings of civil society? He is frequently read as saying this. Uh, when Voltaire uh, wrote, uh, read rather, the second discourse, he said, never has so much intelligence been expended in the attempt to turn us back into brutes. And that is clever, uh, but it's not really right. Uh, Voltaire surely knew that 150 years before Rousseau, uh, there was a French writer by the name of Montaigne, Michel de Montaigne, who had written an important essay called On Cannibals, in which he described the Indian tribes off the coast of Brazil, whom he praised against the true savagery and barbarism of their European conquerors. When he calls that essay, that famous essay, Michel call, Montaigne calls it, of cannibals, it is an open question of who the cannibals are. Are they the, the natives of the Brazilian coast or are they, again, uh, the European conquerors? And Montaigne, like Rousseau, but a, a century or more before, praised 
uh, in many ways, the qualities and the capacities of these sauvages uh, that he discovered uh, and contrasted them to the bloodthirsty cruelty uh, of the Europeans uh, of his own day. Rousseau was deeply influenced by this particular essay. And it's a short essay, and I would suggest at some point when you have a chance, you read it. But in any case, Rousseau makes it plain that a return to the state of nature or some kind of pre-social or pre-civil state is no longer an <coughs> option for civilized beings. In one of the footnotes, and I encourage you to read the footnote, very important footnotes in his, in his book, Rousseau writes, what then? Must we destroy societies, annihilate thine and mine, and return to live in the forests with the bears? A conclusion, he writes, in the style of my adversaries, which I prefer to anticipate rather than to leave to them the shame of drawing. And he says, in other words, no, we can't do that. A return to the state of nature is impossible for us. For the same reason, it would be like returning a domestic animal back to the wild. They and we have simply lost our instinct for self-preservation. It has been dulled by continual association and dependence on others. We would not last a single day. So if a return to nature is impossible, the only alternative in some way is to remain in society. But before we can learn how to live in society, Rousseau wants to tell the story of how it is man became civilized, so to speak. How the transition from nature to culture or from nature to society, in fact, occurred. Uh, in one sense, Rousseau's account of this story can be given in a single word, property. The first sentence of part 